can just mark it. Yes. All right, thanks. Okay, so this is the land use landmarks committee meetings uh, on um, April 3rd, 2023. And I'm Del Teague, chairperson. And let's start with the roll call. Teague here. Sierra. McKeeva. Here. Tesla. Yep. Drinkwater. Here. Indig. Kaminsky. Here. Canton. Here. Peltaborn. Myers. Michelli. Rabbi Niederman. Here. Nieves. Sofer. Vega. Here. Weiser. Here. Andrews. Berger. Here. Awachka. Naplatarski. Stone. Ten members. Ten or, or eleven? You have ten. Okay. Um, so why don't we get started? Uh, Kate Napoletowski will be here any minute. So as I said earlier, the first scheduled presentation from the um, from from the borough president's office has been. Someone is coming through, so please mute yourself. Has been delayed to May first, so we will move to item two, three forty Bushwick Avenue, the New York City Department of Design and Construction renovation and replacement of the heating and cooling system for the Bushwick Branch Library. So who's presenting? Hi, um, I'm Michelle Bonin, and I believe I'm starting uh, off um, just for a, a minute or two, and then we'll be turn we'll turn it over to the our DDC and Cisco counterparts. I'm not sure if they're all here yet, though. I see Anna and Madison. But, yeah, I'm gonna click from Cisco here. Oh, yeah. great. Perfect. Okay. So if it's all right, I I'll start and chair, should I be sharing my screen? Or do you have um jo Joanna, how 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 will she do that? How will she uh, share? With it's a meeting, so she's able to share you're able to share the, the screen just by pressing the share button at the bottom. Okay. Here we go. So everyone I'm assuming can see my screen right now. Are you the partners? Yes, can everyone see? Yes. Great. Okay, so thanks again. Thanks so much for having us to your land use committee to present. Um, I, uh, I just wanted to share that there was a little bit of confusion last month. Um, we had a DDC Cisco presentation on Bushwick Library's HVAC project mistakenly scheduled for the general meeting instead of coming here first. So our sincere apologies for that. We know the importance of coming to talk to you in committee and appreciate being able um, to do that with you all. Um, and there were also some questions that came up about our branches being two branches in the district being closed at the same time. So before I turn this over, I wanted to introduce myself and some folks from the BPL team and, and address that concern. So uh, my name is Michelle Bonin, I'm Vice President for Government and Community Relations, and I'm joined by branch managers of two of the libraries in your community board district today, Lauren Camito of Leonard Library um, and Mark Waldron of Bushwick Library, who will speak in a bit, and also our, our project manager for the project at Brooklyn Public Library in the Capital Planning Department, Jackie Abel. So there are four branches directly in the lines of CB1. I'm sure you all know this, but I'll just quickly go over. We have the new brand new Greenpoint Library and Environmental Action Center, Leonard Library, Williamsburg Library, and Bushwick Library. Leonard, Williamsburg, and Bushwick are all Carnegie branches. So built over a hundred years ago with aging infrastructure um, and BPL 
works with you all and uh, and the city and our excellent elected representatives to raise the funds to renovate these branches. Um, also not on this map is DeKalb Library, which is only a 15 minute walk from Bushwick, though it's not in CB1, it also is a help for patrons who access um, Bushwick Library. Let me just get to my next slide. Okay. so. Um, as was pointed out um, at, at the last meeting, there are two projects um, that are happening and a small part of them will overlap. So as you're going to hear in a bit, Bushwick Library has a proposal to have an HVAC replacement. It's estimated to begin in the spring of 2024. And Leonard Library is actually already closed for an HVAC and roof replacement project. So um, that branch is expected to reopen in the fall of 2024. So the good news is that overlap is only expected to be a few months in the summer of 2024. And we do our best when our branches are closed to set up interim programming in the community when branches have to close long term. This is a photo of our new bookmobiles. It just shows you a typical outside setup. And the bookmobile is one of the interim service tools that we have to help um, bridge services to the community. Um, and Mark, uh, the branch manager for Bushwick, who is on um, and will we'll talk in a bit, has a fantastic team and has already done a lot of outreach, even though we don't have a specific closing date yet and, and we're, we're you know, not there yet, but they're already doing bookmobile service once a month outside. They're working with senior centers and schools in the neighborhood. So while it's too early for him and the branch to have a specific schedule set up for when the branch closes, he and his team are being very proactive and beginning to have these conversations already. Um, so I would like to introduce Lauren Camito, who's the branch manager for Leonard Library, to share a little bit about her interim programming while Leonard is closed. And then she could turn it to Mark to say a few words um, and say hello, and then we'll have DDC do the presentation. So thanks for giving us this time. Lauren? Hi. Yep, so I'm Lauren. Um, we have been slowly ramping up our uh, sort of pop up services since we closed in January. Um, and right now, what we've got going on is we've got the libraries on tap on Tuesdays. So every Tuesday at Talia Williamsburg on uh, Richardson and Leonard, right down the street from the library, we hang out in the brewery all day and drink coffee and uh, check out books, make library cards. A lot of people use the space to do like work from home. Um, and give out uh, grab and go craft kits. And then every other week we have bookmobile service outside of the Leonard Library so that we can be on also on that side of our service area. And every other Thursday alternating with that bookmobile service, we have another pop-up library similar to what we do at Talea at a coffee shop called Here, uh, Here BK. So if you ask where we are, we'll say we're here. Um, their Wi-Fi network uh, is named Guess. So if you ask them what their Wi-Fi is, they'll tell you Guess, and it's a whole thing. It's fun. But it's a whole thing. Um, and so we take our little book wagon that you can see here in the picture all over the place. Um, we'll probably be annoyingly everywhere this summer as soon as it's nice enough to be outside. Um, and then we bring other, you know. We have virtual services and we are working with other departments in the library to bring things like resume coaching in uh, at, so they'll be with us at Talea. Um, and as soon as the, you know, community fairs uh, start popping up, we'll probably show up as as many of those as possible. Uh, we plan to try to pop up at like subway stations, school drop uh, pickup, um, outside food pantries where people are waiting in line uh, as the weather gets warmer. Uh, but because it's been so cold, we've been limited to indoor locations so far. Thanks, Lauren. And I guess I, I just, Mark, if you wanted to say hello and then we'll turn it over to DDC, um, uh, feel free to unmute. Oh, Mark, you're on mute. I'm sorry. Oh, there you go. Hi, sorry. I know the overlap may not be ideal for both branches to close at the same time, but we already prepared though to 
provide services to the community while we were closed. We have a lot of community contacts with Amon, whether it's the um, art studio, and also in the Bushwick Community Center. They have offered us space to use in the interim. So we kind of preparing ourselves for when this happens. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to turn it over to um, the meat of this presentation for land use committee and um, stop sharing my screen. And uh... thank you, Michelle. We appreciate it. Good evening, everyone. My name is Anna Killian. I work for New York City Department of Design and Construction, Office of Communication, Outreach, and Notification. My colleagues on the call is DDC Project Manager Maddie Clyde. Also on the meeting is John. Michaelek from Cisco Hennessy Group, who will talk through the presentation for the Bushwick Branch Library HVAC renovations. John, would you please share your screen and start the presentation? Thank you. Sure. All right, is everybody able to see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. So, as we mentioned before, the Bushwick Library is a Carnegie uh, branch, and it goes back to about 1903. The scope of work for this project is both a HVAC upgrade and roofing replacement. So, the the first part of this is that uh, we'll be providing a new fluid applied roofing system and insulating it to the latest energy codes. We'll be providing new drainage to prevent uh, the clogging of the drains that are currently causing some water infiltration into the library below and a access hatch so that the Roof can be properly maintained as there's no easy access right now without uh, a ladder. At the exterior down on the uh, ground level, we're going to be providing a new mechanical bulkhead, which will help us bring in outside air and mechanical ventilation will be uh, aided when the outside air conditions are appropriate so that we're not using uh, excess energy to maintain the interior spaces. Part of this will require uh, new mechanical bulkheads at the front and side of the building to allow for the proper amount of outside air to be brought into the building. Uh, to help mitigate the look and feel of those book heads, we're going to provide new uh, landscaping to the space uh, to the outside at the uh, Bushwick Avenue side of the building. Within the space, we're going to be replacing the existing mechanical units that are in the cellar level with new units, ductwork, registers, exhaust fans. Some of this will inc include replacement or rerouting of existing electrical conduits in the space, uh, some patchwork to areas where we need to access the ceiling, and any replacement of ceilings that need to be done in uh, coordination with the HVAC work that is done here. So we expect to finish the design for this project in the summer of this year, 2023, with an anticipated construction start in spring of 2024. And the construction should finish about a year and a half later in the fall of 2025. So this is just to give you an idea of the orientation of where the site is located. And these are the cross streets here on Bushwick Avenue between Moore and Siegel Street. Of 
what we're showing here is the proposed location of the mechanical bulkhead for the air intake into the building currently lines up with the existing mechanical room in the basement. This is going to be off to the side and out of the view of most of the street there. Here is a shot of the Siegel Street side of the building where we're going to be redoing some of the point work there to clean up the, the bricking and all that. And again, a continuation of that onto the rear of the building, back where the parking lot is. This is on the opposite side of the building, closer to the Moore Street side, where the existing porch that houses the air cool condensers for the split systems is held. We're going to be up, uh, upgrading the structural to replace any uh, corroded areas there and installing new HVAC units into that porch. And look a little bit further on the side of Moore Street there. This is where the exhaust air will be. Uh, mechanical bulkhead will be installed. So whatever air we bring into the building, we're going to be removing that air from the building to maintain the proper pressurization for the building. Here's another view of that area that we're looking at again for the proposed intake mechanical bulkhead at the front of the building. These are the renderings of what we're planning to do with the roof. The existing roof will be removed. The terracotta on the coping there will be replaced. And existing brickwork, brickwork will be repointed and repaired as required. After the roof is replaced, we'll be providing a new roof hatch with a guardrail to give you access to the roof for cleaning and maintenance. With the new roof replacement and new terracotta coping segments. This rendering here shows where the front mechanical bulkhead will be installed and the greenery, the landscaping that we plan to install with it. These are going to be uh, new shrubbery, skip laurel, and abravita. So these are the key design features. A lot of what we're doing here is to improve the overall comfort of within the library and also improve the energy efficiency of the operation of the library. And that is the, the end of this presentation that I have here right now. Thank you, John. Any questions from the board? Yes, I have a question. Sante Michele. Yeah. Uh, yes, Sante. Yeah, I don't know. Somebody has something to say. Um, can I? Yes, sure. Okay. Yes. Um, now, just uh, what's the depth of this uh, uh, bulkhead that you are showing at the front uh, facade? They're about three feet. Oh, three feet. And what's the height? These are about four feet high. Oh, four feet high. No, I mean, I, I was wondering, um, uh, did you explore the possibility of uh, removing this from the front facade, uh, which I know you're going to put some vegetation there uh, in an attempt 
trying to cover, but seeing that this is an historic building, is this a landmark building or? I know that the, the Carnegie, the Carnegie Library in uh, Williamsburg is landmark. I'm not sure about this one. Yeah, it was a question. Is this? Um, I didn't have the time to. Um, no, it's not a landmark. But uh, beyond that, I was just a question. I was wondering if there was possibility of um, uh, not uh, placing this in the front facade. Uh, there is the rear facade, which has already a structure a bulkhead. What is the reason? Um, uh, is this going to awesome split system? What kind of mechanical uh, is going to be there? So we're going to have air handlers in the cellar there. Uh, they're going to replace the existing air handlers, which are in the front corner of the building at this location. In order to move those mechanical bulkheads to another location, we would actually have to take away some of the occupant, occupied space that you use for some of the library programs. And that's something that we decided was not going to be appropriate for this library. Um, no, and also there is this, uh, you know, open space at the front and I don't know, this may not be the scope of the work, but would have been uh, great if uh, probably relocating whatever was at the back and uh, relocating that one at the front and also the potential of using the open space. Uh, no, it's outside probably of the scope of your presentation, but a very valuable uh, outdoor space could have a table and kids and family could have used that uh, as part of the library, you know, so it would have been, so having that there will a little bit will jeopardize not only the front facade, but definitely uh, the potential use of um, the front uh, space. But well, there, there currently is just a walkway over there right now. And that walkway is going to be replaced. It's going to be shifted further out from the, the facade of the building so that it doesn't impact these louvers. So that that walkway space will be maintained. Sure, but that's all. My comment is I, I wish um, uh, this mechanic would have been uh, located uh, not on a front facade. That's all. Well, thank you. Um, no other questions. Are we? Does anyone want to make a motion? I have one question. It's Trina. Did, with the Leonard Library, was that a year and a half as well? And are, are they on sc schedule? Did the work happen the way it? Um, was projected to happen or is it the ongoing work? Um, so it's a two year project about, but it seems like, uh, it sounds like it is on schedule so far if, if we're projecting fall 2024. And you guys have a garden, you make use of your open space. We do. Yeah, and the, the space that um, we're discussing at, at Bushwick isn't, necessarily usable I've, I've walked around in there um they do make use of the space all the way in the sidewalk area by the book book drop and put furniture out during the during the summer but that space is all behind fencing thank you also um, if i can um uh, to add more on the same topic of uh, trina and probably this was one of the um, uh, major um question at our general meeting uh, last month. Uh, yeah, I know you're going to put some pop up and that's what allowed to rent and take books, but definitely uh, if two library are closed simultaneously, uh, uh, the community is losing the use of the facility, uh, which is not the same. I mean, family, kids can use it, can sit there, can read there and can do research there. Things you, yes, you're going to be able to rent book uh, through the pop-up system, but still the community is going to be impacted on not having two facility operating. So um, did you consider that? Yeah, hi. Um, yes, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm, I think the the 
you know, the unfortunate thing is in order for us to fix up our branches, we have to close them to do the work. Um, so it's always a double edged sword. Um, but I mean, I think, as I stated earlier, the good news is that this is a smaller overlap than than it could have been. So, um, you know, we it takes us years to procure the amount of funding needed to be able to to do these sort of large infrastructure projects. They're particularly costly and difficult in these um, Carnegie branches. Um, and so, you know, we we do what we can with the scheduling, but with um, with 62 locations around the system, we we um, we we try to manage the best that we can to limit service disruptions for the public and and do the best we can. So it is, I know it's unfortunate and it is really hard to lose um, a beloved space for a period of time. Um, but it's it's unfortunate that we we often don't have a choice about that and we just try to make the best. Um, Best we can of our great partnerships in the community, like Lauren has talked about and like Mark is working towards. So, um, hopefully, that it won't be too much of a disruption for you in the summer next year. And you'll be able to use a cooled summer location following this project. I mean, the, the, the issue yeah. here is that we don't have infrastructure that's, you know, <laughs> that's working properly. So every summer we are try to be cooling centers for the city. And in the winter, we want to be warm. And if that's not happening, putting it off is um, not necessarily the answer. Yeah, I mean, as a staff member who was working on site at Leonard through the last several summers, um, calling it an HVAC replacement, I feel is optimistic. It was more, it's more like an installation. We, we were running at about 80 degrees on a regular basis, popped up to 82 every time it went over 95 and had to close for safety. So, um, regard, like we have to close for a few years to fix this, but when we get back open, we'll stay open, which is more reliable for the community to actually know that we'll be open instead of showing up at a closed library because it hit a heat level that we could safely work in anymore, which is also not safe for children and families. Yeah, we also have like a lot of leak leaking problems. The when the when it rains, it leaks all over the building on the side. It leaks in the book. Leak, um, it leaks in the books. It's really been ongoing for the last few years. It's, happened, it's getting worse. All right, I I this is Dale Teague. I'm I'm gonna cut this off right here um, because it sounds to me like these two. Libraries are desperately in need of being fixed and they finally got the funds. And I think that, you know, this will be a wonderful um, uh, addition to the community. We are talking about a, a, a couple of months of overlap, which is unfortunate, but um, I would recommend that we have that we have a motion to approve the application. Uh, I would in Vegas second. Okay, roll call. Uh, let me just um, send to a few. Um, Joanna, can you can you keep the tally while I make the roll call? Yes. Thank you. Teague, yes. Vieira, McKeever, yes. Um, Scheffler, yes. Drinkwater, yes. Indig. Kaminsky. Yes. Canton. Yes. Kelterborn. Yes. Myers. Michelli. Yes. Rabbi Niederman. Yes. Nieves. Sofer. Vega. Yes. Weiser. Weiser, Andrews, Berger, yes, Kowachka, Naplatarski, yes, Stone. Katie, I could barely hear you. I don't know if you can make yourself louder. Yes, I, I heard the yes, but just just to let you know. So 
12, yes. There were no's. Thank you. All right. Moving on. So item number number four. Three. Number that will be our, our um, landmark application. Yes, Trina, the, maybe I, I will do it. And if I need help, can you step in? Sure, and I'll take notes for you, Rosina. <laughs> okay, great. That's great. Uh, okay. Um, the application for uh, 118 North 11th Street, um, uh, the proposed work is for recre uh, recreation of missing windows and the installation of new infilling and uh, signage at the ground floor of the Hecla Iron Works building. This is, um, as, as we know, individual landmark um, properties. So uh, do we have a, a person that's gonna be presented? Uh, yeah, hi, this is Ward Dennis and I'm here with Sarah Sher from my office. Um, I think I will share screen and introduce and then Sarah will walk you through uh the presentation okay. um so let me just let me just get that up sorry one second okay i think everybody can see my screen yeah. um yeah, so hello everybody again. Good to see everybody. Good to be uh, back at this committee. Um, my name is Ward Dennis. I'm with Higgins Quays Barth and Partners, uh, along with my partner, Sarah Scher. We are preservation consultants uh, for the owner of this building, uh, which is 118 North 11th Street. Uh, it's the Hecla Iron Works building. It is an individual landmark. Uh, constructed of cast iron and constructed in the late 1890s. Uh, we've been working with the owners on a facade restoration over the past couple of years. So this photo here, uh, all of the windows on the upper floors were repaired and reglazed and made operable, operable again. Uh, so these are all the original windows uh, with now fully operable sash. Uh, you can see it has a sort of unique uh, upper center pivot window and then a lower uh, vertical center pivot window. Uh, the application that we're here for today is at the base of the building, uh, which you can see in its existing condition. Uh, the owner has a new tenant, uh, which is a group called Swingers, which is a interior miniature golf facility. Uh, <laughs> as Yes, uh, as part of that, uh, we are proposing to restore uh, much of the base of the building and install new entries uh, at both the east end, which is at the left side and the west end, which is at the right side. Um, uh, so, Sarah, I will let you take over and I will click forward when you tell me. Okay, thanks, Ward. Uh, Sarah Scher, Higgins, Space Barth and Partners. Um, as Ward mentioned, this is the Hecla Ironworks building, which was designed and constructed by um, Hecla, which was uh, the most one of the more important manufacturers of architectural ironwork uh, in the United States in the mid 19th century uh, and the early 20th century. Uh, and this building was designed as their headquarters between 1896 and 1897, uh, and it was designated as a landmark in 2004. Uh, so I'm going to go through some historic documentation and existing conditions uh, so that you can get a sense of the changes that have been done at the building. Uh, and then we'll go through the drawings to describe the proposed scope of work. Uh, so next. Yep. And sorry, I forgot to mention that uh, this presentation has been updated slightly at the request of uh, landmark staff. Uh, so it has a couple small changes from what was sent to you earlier. Yes. Uh, so this is our earliest documentation of what the building 
might have looked like. This is from 1909 and is a postcard showing the um, Hecla campus. The landmark building is in the, the right side of the photo. In the upper right side, we have a zoomed in image of the ground floor of uh, the building, which just shows us that there was a stable door entrance. We can see a horse coming out of the building. Um, and then the rest of the ground floor is showing windows, uh, sort of that tripartite configuration that exists at the upper floors. Next. Uh, and then in terms of historic photos that show the base more clearly, we really just have the circa 1940 tax photo from the municipal archives. Uh, and this is um, very good at showing us what the base of the building looked like. Um, on the west side or the bottom right photo, we can see that stable entrance is showing it on the opposite side of the building that the postcard did. But we have got a traditional stable doors that were likely wood with these large multi light uh, window openings. Uh, and then flanking the stable door, we can see in this photo some side lights um, that are multi light that are now missing that will be recreated as part of the project. At the east side of the building, uh, which is a zoom in on the top right corner, there's this tripartite division with uh, two door entrance doors flanking um, a middle bay that has some kind of infill in it with a, a cast iron bulkhead below. Uh, you can also see in this photo um, signage that are above those three um, bays that still exist and then signage along the spandrels across the base of the building. Uh, we also see in this photo the center three bays have that multi light window configuration that exists at the upper floors. Um, none of the windows in this photo are being operated, but we'll presume that they were also operable like the upper floor sash. Uh, next photo. Uh, so, as I mentioned, the building was designated an individual landmark in 2004, and this is the photo that was taken at the time of designation. So, you can see the ground floor at that time had already been um, modified significantly. All of the windows um, had been removed, the stable doors removed, um, and the door configurations changed around. Uh, we have photos going back to the 80s that also show this. So, this happened sometime before 1985. Uh, next photo. And then the existing condition is very similar to what it was like at designation. The main difference being that uh, the base has been heavily graffitied. Uh, part of the scope of this project will be to remove the paint and the graffiti from the ground floor to, to clean up the base so that the cast iron finish can read through again. Uh, and then the next series of photos will go bay by bay from um, left to right, just so you can see the existing conditions a little more clearly through the, the paint and graffiti. Uh, so this is our Eastern Bay with the entrances uh, on the left side is the existing entrance to um, the door. The middle is brick infill with a, a sign board in front of it that exists. And then the right is um, stucco infill with a cast iron saddle at the base. So what we'll be doing in this bay is creating an opening for swingers in the right hand bay that matches that of the entrance, uh, the existing entrance. So a recessed door with brick infill around it. And then the, the sign board will be reused for um, some signage. Uh, and the um, 118 that you see on top of the right hand bay will um, be repainted with um, tenant signage that will match the font of the office signage that we see on the left side. Next, uh, this bay just to the right of the entrance has been the most modified. We've lost um, the cast iron bulkhead that stretched across the base. It's all been infilled with CMU and also um, the base below the cast iron pilaster has been removed, but will be recreated as part of this project just to bring back some um, grounding for that cast iron in this in this bay. Uh, the staircase for the building is behind um, this uh, part of the facade. So as part of uh, adaptively reusing the building, there needs to be some egress from that stair. So we're proposing to do a punched opening in the CMU to allow uh, egress through this bay of the building. Next. These two bays um, historically had the multi-light windows that we see on the upper floors and all have those have all been removed and this is stucco with steel bracing in front of it. 
um, as part of this application, all of this will come out and new steel windows to match those above, um, but with fixed operability will be installed in their place. Next. Uh, and then the westernmost bay that used to have a stable door uh, now has a, a roll down garage with um, housing. What we're not seeing in this photo is behind the garage door, there are additional cast iron pilasters uh, that would have framed those side lights that were uh, on the end of this bay. So um, by removing the garage door, we'll see those cast iron pilasters again. We'll be recreating the missing uh, glazed windows uh, as side lights. And then there'll be new infill here that allow for the second means of egress, but also reference um, a stable door design um, while meeting code requirements in this bay. Next. Um, so here's an overall plan of the, the tenant space. Um, Ward, if you could just, yes. So that's the landmark building is just the bottom right corner of this sheet. Um, so it's just a piece of the overall footprint of what the, the space will be. Um, uh, so the entrance will be there and then they'll, they'll be part of the area here. We can go to the next slide though. Um, Overall elevations, existing elevation at the top, proposed at the bottom. Um, the top three floors aren't part of this proposal, but we wanted to show you what the, the context of the application looks like uh, with the whole building. Uh, so you can see the restoration work and the center bays um, and um, the recreation of the side lights and the, the stable door entrance. And then we have basically three new door openings for for code requirements and access requirements. On the left-hand side, a new door to get into the tenant space, and then two egress doors, one in the existing CMU, and then one all the way on the right that's integrated into this infill that's um, referenced, uh, that's referencing the stable door design. And next we can zoom in a little bit more. <clears throat> Uh, so here's a proposed elevation and a, a partial plan below just to show how the inside is interacting um, with the outside. So um, in the easternmost bay, we have the new entrance that's leading to an entrance vestibule for the, for the tenant space. There'll be signage um, at the existing sign panel to the left and then signage above uh, in the area where there's already painted lettering. To the right of that, we have the new egress door that connects to the stairs um, and we'll be recreating that uh, base beneath the cast iron pilaster as well. So it's more grounded on the facade. Uh, the six windows will be installed to match historic new steel windows that will be fixed. Um, as you can see in the plan, there's a partition that will be behind one of the window bays um, to protect the windows from back of house um, operations in that location. Um, in order to block visibility of the partition, we're proposing some opaque vinyl decals that are the colors of the tenant that we'll look at later on in the presentation. The decals are reversible, so whenever the, the wall goes away, they can just be removed and then you just have a window as well. But um, as part of the proposal is the, the decals. And um, the bay just to the east of that will also have decals, but they'll be transparent, but the same um, coloration, just so there's consistency at the ground floor um, sort of window storefront uh, configuration. And then all the way on the right, we see that um, tripartite uh, stable door um, recreation with um, an egress option there, which we'll, we'll see in more detail. Okay, next. Um, and then we have existing and proposed bay by bay, just so you can see the details. Um, the uh, window above the um, main door is going to be infilled with brick as it's not a um, historic condition. Uh, the sign panel will be replaced with a, a new um, tenant sign. And then we have the new door to match the existing door on the right with brick infill around it and then recessed at the same plane as the existing door. Uh, next. Uh, and here we're seeing the CMU existing condition. A new egress door will be added to that um, existing condition. And then the pilaster will, will receive a new base just so it's not floating, a new cast iron base. Uh, next. 
Uh, and here's a detail of the windows um, going from uh, stucco and steel bracing to beautiful steel windows that are fixed. The next um, page, we can see the details. As Ward mentioned, um, because of all the restoration work on the upper floors, we have we've all ha already have these great drawings of the existing conditions of the steel windows. Uh, and so we'll be able to duplicate these details with fixed um, operability for the new ones. And you'll see on the next sheet that the, um, the details are the same um, between historic and proposed. Uh, next. And then a detail of the um, stable door bay. So on the left, it's showing how the um, roll down garage door blocks the inner cast iron pilasters. Currently, all of that will be, um, all of the garage, non-historic garage infill will be removed. The housing will be removed. Um, the cast iron restored with the new um, side lights to recreate the historic will be um, flanking that bay. And then in the middle, you know, we looked at lots of different designs. I think you saw one when we um, sent the previous version of the presentation, the challenge of creating something that references the stable door infill while also providing egress and meeting code. Um, and so we sort of played on the idea of um, a stable door design and that tripartite system that we're seeing throughout the building to create this um, metal infill that allows for a door, but also something to occupy the space that currently doesn't have anything in it. Um, and uh, I think the next sheet is just, yes, uh, in interior elevations about exterior elevations and sections. If you wanna look at anything more closely, just let me know. And then the next sheet, uh, this is the colors uh, of the final decals, the four ones that are high highlighted in purple that will be in a mix on the um, uh, window glazing. And like I said, they're reversible. They're just stickers that can go on and off the windows. Um, and then the bottom is an intercom that's proposed next to the uh, tenant entrance uh, that will be attached to new, new brick. Um, and with that, I think we could go back to um, an elevation if anybody has any questions. Um, I just wanted I just wanted to add one thing, uh, which is the the windows that we're proposing at the base of the building. Uh, first off, the details that we saw were used to replicate missing elements above. Uh, and secondly, these windows, the reason this is going to public hearing for the windows is because we're making them fixed windows because they're for a storefront. Uh, if we were doing them as operable windows, it could be approved at staff level. I have a question, Simon. Yes, Simon. Mm -hmm. Simon, yes. Yeah, just to know, you mentioned about the graffiti that's on, was going to be removed. How do you, how do you remove that? Does it as we come the does you do you see the original how it was originally when it was built like how, how do you are you able to remove the whole um how, how's it go? Uh, there's a, a variety of different chemical um, cleaners that remove paint from cast iron. I think as part of this we'll need to test um, chemical cleaners. There's also the option of um, like a wet abrasive that can remove paint, but I, my guess is that a chemical cleaner will be able to remove the paint from the base of the building. Okay, thank you. Any other I, questions? I have a question. Oh, Rosina, I'm sorry, did you have a question? No, 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 no. Okay. Uh, I have a question about the windows um, on the ground floor and the colors. It, are you they'll be put the colors will get put in the windows just so you can't actually see in them is that and it, will there be multiple colors because you showed a palette of different colors right it's it's four different colors um one color per light or um you know glazed unit um and the the idea is you, if you can see in this plan here there's a partition in that one bay so the the vinyl decals would be opaque in that one bay so that you don't not looking at a, a partition or sheetrock partition behind it. The the decals adjacent will be translucent so that you can see through them. Um, but it just to give some 
consistency to how those windows are treated. They're, they'll both have the colors. Are proposed. And the colors will be checkerboarded? Yes. That's just a design, a playful design decision? Yeah, it, it's the attendant's design. Uh, I have a question. Okay. Yeah. Bill? Um, uh, one is about these decals. Uh, is that something that we are even, that we are looking at? Is that something that you need approval for from landmarks? Yes. Um, yeah, yes, for an individual landmark. I think um, there are no rules related to decals on windows at the ground floor. So if you're installing decals that are beyond, you know, a grayscale decal blocking a soffit, then it needs a public hearing approval. And and you're saying these are removable? They can, you can stick Yep. They're you literally a, they're a sticker that gets applied to the inside of the window. Okay. And I have another question. The brick around the um, the doorways is is there brick on any other part of the building? Um, besides the side elevations, no, not on the front. Is just um, cast iron, and then the the various generations of masonry infill at the base. So, so, it's so what there, made there you choose is, brick? No, this is existing brick at this right. Right. Oh, at this exactly. bay, and this is existing CMU CMU. at this bay. Okay. So that's, that's we're we're not removing question. anything. We're just putting doors within existing masonry. Okay. Because I was wondering why you chose brick, but yeah. okay. Thank you. All right. Those are my okay. questions. I have a question. Okay, Steve. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot for the president. Hey, Ward. Good to see you. Um, this is a, uh, you know, just a really, really great project. I'm glad that. Uh, there's, you know, restoration effort going on. It's a favorite building of mine. Um, question I had is about the former stable door on, I guess, on the west end. Um, if there was an attempt to, I guess, more closely recreate the stable door, like why just having like a tube panel, you know, uh, large door that opened up or have that as sort of, I guess, a... Uh, Opening up to reveal, you know, a smaller, I guess, more manageable door. Yes, uh, we've looked at many different um, <laughs> configurations for this door. It's challenging because of it, it's a proper egress door, so it has to be um, a, a door that somebody can push out easily to exit the building. Uh, it also has to meet a two-hour fire rating, so it it has to be a metal. Door, it can't be wood. So we, we've tried to look at um, like a door within what is a cricket door um, configuration, but just nothing was looking quite quite right. Um, so we did end up going a little bit farther away from a, a sort of pure restoration approach to something that's more um, contemporary, but in the spirit of the stable door and also that tripartite divisions that we're seeing across the, the building. But yes, we looked at many. <laughs> Many different options here. Um, okay. Do each of the three doors open? I don't understand how. It's just one door. Just one. Um, and it, those are panels next to it. Oh, okay. So it's just the. Yeah. So it's an illusion of of actually having three doors together. Uh, I have a question too. Yes, Santa. Hi. I thank you guys. Thank you, uh, Ward. Um, uh, very happy to see that uh, you're going to maintain and uh, recreate uh, the steel window. Uh, and this building always amazed me. But, you know, if, if you know the history of the building and also there is a very early for the time uh, carton wall uh, system, uh, if we can call it that way. Um, so uh, very thank you so much. Uh, and also, you know, I don't know if committee member knows, but uh, this company, uh, I'm a passionate, uh, I had a fabrication business uh, too uh, with my design practice. And it's very interesting. They actually had developed a finish that was in part of the metallurgic process of this window. So they were kind of pioneer uh, at, at the time. They also uh, uh, 
they work on the Flatiron building, they work in so many buildings in New York City that they have still at the time. Um, so I really thank you for uh, the work. Uh, the only question I have, I'm less disturbed by the carriage. Uh, I believe it's kind of as a vocabulary which is in, in tune uh, with the existing uh, language of the building. Uh, the only things uh, I have a question is the in that elevation next to the office where you add the third door, and I believe right now it's kind of paneled, uh, you cannot see uh, those blocks there, uh, but definitely originally they were in the 1940s uh, tax block photos show us the same uh, uh, um, series of three window or steel window. Uh, uh, why are you maintaining the blocks and uh, why you're actually not trying to introduce the door, uh, uh, maintaining the language of these three window. Uh, it feels a little bit still an anomaly to have these uh, uh, concrete blocks there. Um, so that's the only, um, the only things I feel a little bit strange about. Right, I, th I mean, I think part of it is timing. Um, it's, you know, trying to get the egress requirements in place so that the the tenant can open their business. Um, and this is sort of a non-invasive way to provide the egress and then potentially come back for more restorative work in the in the future. Um, but yeah, in order to restore this, you would you would need a lot more cast iron. Um, you'd probably want to bring back the missing pilaster and maybe relocate the door. Um, you know a little this way or that way. I mean, it would be a lot of work because you'd have to remove the CMU. You'd have to infill with windows or some other kind of metal infill um, scenario. Um, and you're sort of taking advantage of the fact that there's a, a CMU wall there. Um, it's, a, it's a reversible and appropriate um, solution for uh, the timeline that the project is on. This is also the main egress for all the upper floors of the building, yeah. uh, the, the secondary means of egress for the upper floors of the building. So we need a rated entrance. The CMU provides a rated entrance. Uh, mm -hmm. We could not restore that to, you know, fully glazed openings that you could actually see through. It would be something with a CMU wall probably behind it to get the required fire rating. Okay. okay, any other questions? If anybody wants to uh, make a yeah, I yeah, a I have a question. Can can you hear me, Bojana? Yeah. It's Katie. Yes. Hi, Katie. Go ahead. Katie. Hello? Hello. Paul also has his hand up. Okay, Paul, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, I was curious about this, the signage board. Did you say that was original to the uh, building and is that gonna be reused by the tenant? Uh, it is existing. Um, we're not sure when it was installed sometime pre designation and it will be reused for the, the tenant. The black rectangle that's next to the door, right? On the yep. eastern part? Yep. Yeah, okay, okay. Okay, that was it. Thank you. Katie? I don't see anybody else with the hand. Yeah, I raised my hand again, uh, busy enough. Oh, okay, Steve, go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, just, um, yeah, what stuck in my mind is the question about the decals. Um, decals. Um, if there's potential alternative to that, I'm just thinking my mind those will really stand out in contrast to you know, kind of the monochrome nature of the building. Um, the, if other types of signage were was was explored, like a metal sign hanging from you know, rod in a chain or something like that, um, as opposed to, you know, uh, colorized um, decals. 
Uh, I, we haven't explored other options. We felt like it was a, a good way to do something sort of non-invasive that um, both blocked the visibility of the partition, but sort of enlivened the the window storefront experience. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, uh, we think decal is sort of like a, a harmless way to add some um, uh, character to those two bays while providing limited visibility of the partition beyond. I think a partition beyond would be worse, um, just looking at a wall through a, a restored window, but I think. Uh, and you consider just one color? Minimal amount of, uh, well, I think that that's a uh, tenant branding question. Yeah. Uh, uh, but I, I, it's sort of related to that. I was gonna say, we have a very minimal amount of signage uh, on this building, considering the tenant is taking most of the most of the ground floor here, uh, there's the repainted historic sign above the entrance, and then the uh, reusing the existing vertical sign. So, uh, at these window locations, there isn't really a place to attach a sign because it would mean drilling into the cast iron. Um, so, you know the as Sarah said, the decals are fully reversible. Uh, they do create a playful color, but uh, do so in a way that does not does no harm. I have a question. Um, it it okay. has to do with the decals too, and I, I don't know if we're just being petty about this, but it just seems to me the building is it's so dignified, and then these decals will they just cheapen the 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 look will it will they actually take away from the dignity of the building uh, that's one of the reasons i asked if if you actually had to get approved you know whether this was something that needed approval because i i do understand that it's it's they're removable um but i can just see walking by people walking by and saying why did they do that to that beautiful building i i don't know i i don't know how other people feel I, otherwise, I think it's a great, great project. I feel similarly. It's it's a concern. I wouldn't say it, you know. It's yeah. just that it stand out in a potentially um, obtrusive sort of way. I think one muted color would look nice in it, rather than the checkerboard different colors. Is it um, on that note? Is it possible to see a rendering of the colored windows? Yeah, that that's a good question. I was gonna. I was hoping you had had some kind of a rendering. I don't know if it's even possible to do, but I don't know. I, I guess I'm sitting here thinking, I'm kind of surprised you all are are happy with that. That this is an amazing project that you're doing, and then got these decals, these colored decals, you know, like stick on things on these amazing windows. Chloe, Chloe, you ha you wanted to say something. No, that's okay. That was actually what I, I just decided to chime in about the colored windows. Oh, okay. I mean, I, I guess my only question really was uh, sort of what other differences, you know, did the group feel that is being presented tonight that we should be considering? Because I think that that's really the main point is the colored windows and it's hard for us, I think, really to, mm -hmm. you know, it could be cool. I don't, I don't know. I'd have to see it in order to answer the question and if there was anything else we really should be focusing in on. Also, I mean, we can ask about developing a rendering, and if we do, then we can submit to you. But we uh, there is we didn't prepare a rendering for uh, this application, and and actually, Landmarks hasn't asked for one yet. Um, uh, and also, we can you know we can discuss with uh, the tenant Trina's uh, suggestion to you know uh, make it more more uniform, uh, one or two colors. I think this is more uh, more agreeable. But also, Dale, some something else I will, you know, uh, definitely the decal, you know, uh, I believe it's a less of a concern. Uh, of course, can be intrusive. Uh, I didn't focus into that, so I understand where you're coming from. 
uh, I believe uh, what I tried to point to you before, um, and I can only imagine that the firm will want to do the best, uh, definitely, of, of the design in terms of conservation and preserving this building and bring it to its original beauty. Uh, I also understand now, you know, the clients has different needs, which are commercial business needs. Uh, uh, I believe uh, consider that uh, elevation where there are those blocks, where there were this look at the 1940 picture, because I believe the moment we approved, we, uh, the door wasn't there. I know it's going to serve, and that will require, as Ward was saying, additional studies and additional understanding and the fireproofing. But still, this is, a, 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 this is an exclusive, uh, uh, historic, uh, uh, in, you know, unique landmark. And, and we're gonna prove to alter entirely that facade, even if uh, nothing will exclude it in the future, uh, uh, it could you know, bring back uh, uh, the three original window. But right now, our approval will say that we are okay with not restoring that according to the 1940 tax photo, you know? And, and there is something that, uh, the door, yes, if we look at that uh, uh, first elevation, uh, the 106, there, uh, it's, you know, it, it, the door looks the same, but if you look at the 1940 tax block photo, you have like a repetition of those three steel windows, they're not gonna be there, and the blocks, of course, he was there behind, but my question is, once we do this type of uh, 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 conservation and we do all this type of work, wouldn't you want to have the building uh, go back, you know, at least in this uh, uh, front facade to have that uh, uh, three window or somehow to try to es explore and introduce that door uh, uh, with some element that will link more in terms of also transparency. So um, I understood what you were saying, word, but I, I want to make it, out for the committee that it's a very uh, uh, critical element, more than the decal, which can always be removed, and of course, but our approval, our approval will say we're fine with that. I believe that's the most critical part of this intervention. That's, that's all my comment for the committee. Just to be clear, though, the application is to install the door. Everything else at that bay is existing. Anybody else? I don't have. Uh, I don't have a view. Who has the hand up? Anybody else? I don't see any hands up. Okay. But any anybody wants to make a motion on uh, this Simon. project? Simon. Yes, Simon. Yes, Simon. I'd like to make, like to make a motion to approve the project. There's any second? William Vega seconds. Hey, William. Um, are we going to do the roll call? Should I do it as somebody? Oh. Quick so, question, Rosanna. Just on, on this motion, is there any follow up on the colored windows as part of this? Well, that's um, uh, uh, motion. Yeah, I was just listening to what Sante had said as yeah. his, you know, perspective, and I think that others share it. So I wasn't sure if that that was going to be included, or if it could be. It could be. Yeah, I, I, I think it should be included. It was mentioned by Sorry. numerous people. I, I, I agree. I mean, I would hate to have us vote this down just because of the, the decals, but we, we, I, I would, um, Simon, would you include our concern about the decals and, and our recommendation that they do something more, uh, more subtle? Yeah, if the, if the committee feels so, uh, everybody, I, if it's not a uh, major Concern for the presenter. 
I mean, I, I would love just to actually see it. I, I don't want to necessarily make it that we have to change something um, because maybe it, you know, maybe it is subtle enough. It's just kind of hard to know at this point. Corey, I don't know how practical that is. They, they want, uh, they want a response. Got it. We need a response tonight. Yeah. And um, we look at this slide with your until the next but, committee meeting. You know, um, okay, um, one, one at a time, please. Uh, a motion was made and second, so you either have to rescind it or start a new motion. That's what I'm understanding. No, we can have a discussion on the motion. Did we see the, the we ask for a friendly, a friendly, um, we can ask for a friendly addition to the. Uh, yeah, know. that's a good suggestion, Trina. Can we see one more time the slides uh, uh, showing the colors? Mm. Sarah? Oh, where okay. it is. But I got, I have control, but. Oh, okay. There you go. So, Ward or Sarah, can you explain how the windows we're looking at um, all these different colors? How would that work? What's the plan for using those colors? In the windows, um, I, I do have, um. I'm just looking through older materials that have been sent to me from. The tenant that might be helpful. Um, let me just try to send it to board and maybe he can bring it up. Uh, I just um, try to do a screenshot, see if that's helpful. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. So this is what we were saying the tenant mm -hmm. um, to show their their concept, sort of this pastel um, color. Well, I see it's very light. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I feel like it. It's definitely, um, you know, less. I don't see color. It's noticeable, but it's still it's still noticeable. You know, is there I'm color not. here? I don't even see color on this. Yeah, there's pastel colors, very light. Almost like it has a sheen yeah. quality to yeah. it. Very subtle. Yeah. It's oh, I see. Like, I see. It. Uh, yeah. I yeah. see. Sorry, sorry. I didn't. No, that's that's very vertigo. Helpful. Yeah. I see. Okay. Yeah. And will that actually make them not translucent? Yeah. Yeah. Some will be opaque. The three on the right will be opaque and the three on the left will be translucent. Right. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. I, I didn't mean to uh, take this meeting out of order, but I, I feel it's really helpful to see this. And personally, it, um, it doesn't bother me actually um, from looking at this rendering. And I think the rest of the building is a really good design. So, you know. All right. So can we? So is go? this is this what they're gonna what they are actually gonna look like? This this very light pastel color. That that's how it's always been represented to us. We can certainly um, follow up to make sure that what they've sent us previously is what it's going to be installed. Because I, I I don't think that was clear before. At least not to me anyway. Okay. It's different than the little paint chips that you the colors that you show. Yeah, the, co the colors yeah, are much are darker. Yeah. Yeah. You actually know, I mean, they have other locations. Is this like a signature thing? Is this something like someone could look on the website and see, or is this specific right. to this it's location? Their, it's their signature colors. I don't know if they've used decals before at their other locations. Okay. I, I did look on their website, uh, Keith, and what is on their website is a little bit darker than what you see here, but I also don't want to make a representation. And that that's, you know, their plan. Yep. So we have a motion on the floor. To approve the, the project uh, as presented with uh, understanding that uh, we had a concern uh, about the colors. Um, which was explained to us that it's going to be. Uh, as shown. What about uh, the, uh, 
the eastern doorways, that panel that Sante referenced. Yeah, but he didn't make um, any motion. He just uh, made, um, I think he just made the statement for, for the committee. And to I didn't have a yeah. motion about, about the colors either. We're just, we're adding conditions to the well, motion. Well, what, what, Steve, the, the, the colors was not a condition. It was just. No, we just want, minor. wanted to see. It was minor, so I didn't think it made any sense to have to go through a whole thing just for something as minor as, 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 as a concern or, but. What you didn't talking receive, about is, is a major um, issue. But you didn't receive my observation, which I, that's why I thank you, Steve, for reminding that. I stopped there because I want to uh, remind you uh, that yes, that portion there, the block are existing, but the door, uh, it, it, it's something, the moment we approve it, we're gonna jeopardize <laughs> the future of uh, having if hypothetically, that uh, three glass window there that they are reported there. If this is such a model, uh, you know, that we should apply, I don't know. Uh, I, I have question about that. Uh, at, at least to, to invite, uh, uh, definitely to explore that and, and to bring also, I'm sure LPC will we look at that because it's very visible and the, the commission may be okay with that. But if we want to be objective, all the focus on the decal, which uh, I can consider valuable, but as I said, less concerning, they are removable. Our uh, granting approval to that door, uh, even if the block are assisting and later on, but later on the door is gonna be part of that approval. You know, and everything will have to work around the door. It's not so, may not be supposed to be uh, that way. You know, I'm not saying so we're, we, we're letting the stable door go. Um, yeah, but it, you see, there was some work I believe that was done there, and uh, um, you know that somehow, and who knows, was the stable door added in 1940? M probably. You know, they, did they did they have a different door? Uh, we don't know that, did I enlarge that? But for sure, those windows, they are probably some of the most valuable element of that original design. This carton wall system was probably, uh, uh, you know, the most important element of the building was done by this window. But, but you, you're talking about the, the, sta the sta stable door, the, the, no, the one no, uh, no. at the end? No, I'm talking about the elevation, I believe, um, I don't know what you say, 107? Oh, 118. Um, okay. And next to the, uh, where there is the office, there is the mm -hmm. riding with the original office entrance. Uh, if you look at, look at the 19, it's important to make this comparison, you know, then if we say that you are okay with that, but uh, I had to bring it to your attention that we are proving a new element is the door. The door will change uh, uh, definitely the configuration of that uh, portion of the building. So anything they want to do in the future is going to work around the door. <laughs> they're going to demolish the door entirely, but we are proving a new element, which is the door. That substitute, you know, hypothetically, the moment you go and intervene, you remove a portion of that, you should bring to that original fabric that was there. And I, I believe it's only dictated by the need of uh, the owner, the tenant, uh, I can't imagine that from a design but perspective, I think, that's what you but want. But I think, I think Santa from the old pictures, as I, I remember, there, uh, there was no um, uh, small doors. There were also horses going into the building in, in, in that uh, location. No, you are misunderstanding, uh, uh, Bosina. I'm talking about from the left next yes. to the office yes yes i know but from the other pictures old pictures we had also horses going uh, the carriages going uh, on the first where the offices were yes not where not the where the three windows were but on the first one too i believe i saw i saw one photograph uh, old photograph that oh, had I, uh, I have, look i have the we have the presentation i have the pdf exactly the one that they presented uh, the first portion where there is the sign that says I, I understand. Yes, I, I'm looking next, at it. 
Next, yeah. there are no carriage. Next, there are three windows. And you can see that. And where the, where the carriage door that you saw is a carriage door that you saw in 1940. Looking at that uh, um, um, uh, etching there uh, and the second page, Brooklyn Eagle postcard series 66, the carriage door are not there at that time. Mm -hmm. So that's, if we want to look at that, the carriage door are not there, but because our historic document for LPC is the 1940 uh, photos from the tax block. So the tax block uh, uh, report the wood carriage door that probably were done in the 30s. Who knows, in the 20s, it doesn't matter. But at the time, 1940 is our oldest uh, uh, image. This is something that could be presented to LPC, and I don't know if they will consider these, uh, the Eagle postcard uh, that uh, is shown here, but definitely where we, uh, where we are asked to insert that door, that door wasn't there in that drawings that you see. This it's, for it's an for egress the door, isn't it? It's a, it's, yeah. Yeah, but uh, for the record, if we want to be corrected, uh, this, this is what it is. I'm just analyzing a drawing, so I'm looking at the document. Um, just, uh, we absolutely could not restore that bay back to its original condition because the original condition was all windows. We need an egress door out of the fire stair for the building, period. Okay. No, no, that I understood. I was wondering if there was a way together with the LPC to elaborate something could be more harmonious. As I said, you know, the carriage door, there is a vocabulary, there is a language that had introduced somehow. And, and I didn't make any comment that I was against that, despite, you know, uh, I was aware that originally they weren't that. That's if we want to include in a motion uh, uh, committee member. Uh, that that's a consideration, you know, uh, something to explore as a possibility. Can we harmonize them more? You know, I, I feel like it's, I feel like it's a decent intervention considering the, uh, you know, the egress requirements. I just, you know, I just looked at the, the diagram again and, um, I don't know, I feel like I feel like it's a better intervention than the than the carriage door. So and people are concerned about the carriage door. Okay, we have a motion on the floor. Uh should we vote and then if there will be um not enough votes, we can make another motion if that's what the committee wants. Yes, let's do that. Okay, so uh, the motion is to approve approve the project as presented. Um, uh, more, oh, one second. Deltic. Yes. Wait, I'm sorry, point of order, but with, but with the concern about the, the, the color oh, no. details. No, it's uh, it's just uh, the motion was to, uh, to approve. Uh, if the Simon wants to wants to include um, uh, the issue with the decal, then uh, then we can include it. Simon, 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 uh, do you want to include include the the, uh, the committee's concern in your motion to approve with? Uh, concern uh, regarding um, uh, the coloring of the decal. I mean, I see mo most um, committee members and uh, uh, saw both renderings and they realized that it really would make a difference that I hear from the most members. So I don't think. Uh, Simon, only two uh, members spoke. So that's, that's okay. So I want to hear, I, I didn't hear from any other members, you know, if, if other members feel the same, you know, put it in the motion. You know, I gladly put it in, but it uh, all depends on the committee. Maybe we should so, have uh, uh, all the concern we we brought out. Maybe they should be uh, included. 
I mean, at the end of the story, LPC is going to make the... Uh, uh, okay, let's... Uh, Santi, we have a motion on the table, and we somebody mentioned about, about the color. So let's 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 stick to one item. No, but if you mentioned first. about the color, we mentioned what Steve Chesler said about the carriage but, door. We mentioned what I said about... Yeah, but, uh, the but uh, Santi, point of order. I think at this time, um, uh, Simon made a motion, and it's up to him to amend that motion, include something. If he wants to include it, then we... Uh, we will include it. Otherwise, we have a motion that was second, and we have to vote on it. Let, the motion... let, what be, what, let me clearly. What will be the vote? What will be the vote? The wording about the coloring of the how, how how would the motion? Uh, how would we? Uh, how would we? Uh, Trina, we... help me with uh, with the motion. Uh, it would be a motion to approve with concern about the the multiple color color decals in the window and a request that. Um, that maybe that it could be mono one color. I'm I'm okay with that. With that, we're putting it into the motion. If the committee feels that we should put it in, uh, I'm okay with that. You're not okay with the other things, uh, um, Simon? Uh, it's too vague. I mean, this is issue. I think is more. You know, I think it more. Oh, the other are too vague. Why are too vague? Okay. The other one. Okay, Ma really Mr. Mr. Vega, are, are you willing to second? Amend, uh, amended yeah. motion. I, 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 wait, wait, before we even add this thing, it seems to me that some of us who were concerned about the colors of the, of the, um, the, uh, the stick ons just when we realized it was, they were all very, very pastel. I think most of us said. We it's okay. Weren't really, it was, a, we were okay with it. Does anyone, does anyone really need to have that as a concern? Now that we see that it's just very pastel. I do. I still have a problem with adding uh, color. I don't. I do too. Period. Period. Okay, so two people have, but. Um... I mean, is it possible to say that? Because my concern is really just how bright they are, actually. Um, yeah. So, you know, I, I would be fine with just saying that we have some concern over that. I don't know how that actually plays out, but just because so, to me, it's like how noticeable it is is, is important. All right, Simon, you're willing to put that in that there's concern about the the colors and uh, of the uh, decals. Right. Okay, it's not a condition; it's just a concern. And land, right. land right. landmarks can investigate. Okay, right. well, William, you second it. Uh, yes, I'm. I'm still. Uh, still seconding. I'm fine with that. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. So, um, Deltic. Yes. Uh, Viera. She's not here. Um, Trina McRiver. Yes. Um, Steve Chesler. Yes. Ellen Drinkwater. Yes. Mo Moshe Indig. Um, yes. Kaminsky. Yes. Um, Kantin. Yes. Uh, Robert Keldborn. Yes. That's Paul. 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 I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's Paul, not Robert. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. For the record. Uh, for the record. For the record. That's good. Mayors. Michelli. No. Robbie Needleman. Nevis. Sulfur. Vega. Yes. Yes. Okay. Weiser. Yes. Andrews. Berger. Yes. Kavochka. Yes. Naplatarski. Okay, so we have one, two, three, four, five, six. We have ten yes and one no. Motion, motion carries. Okay, that's it for me. Katie Napa's first. You just texted me that she voted yes. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay. So that's going to be eleven. She has poor reception. Okay. Eleven yes and one no. Okay, that that uh, that's it for for this project, though. Okay, thank you. So the last thing we were going to do um, is 
just a discussion of the rules regarding the IBIA special permit. And um, I don't plan to take much time on this. Um, we received a printout from Ms. Chang. I think it, Joanna, please correct me if, if this is wrong, but I think it came to us on March 23rd. Yes. So it, it's a it's a very good um, it's a very nice printout. She sent us a, a, uh, an attachment, and then she gives links to click on, and you can get um, you can get the information both about the 12, 12 Franklin Street and the renewal that's going to be coming up in at our next committee meeting, and in in this in this printout, you also get the general requirements, the general um, conditions and the findings that you need for these special permits, which I, you know, is what I really wanted to do because not only do we have 12 Franklin coming back to get um, an extension to get a, a three-year renewal, but, but we may have other um, applications coming to us just you know, on, a, on a, from the ground up. So uh, I won't take up much of your time, but basically um, they talk about the overall condition. Okay. Yes, they talk about the overall condition, the the amount of um, required industrial use versus retail and and office space, and the, the height, the setback, the requirements for the for the um, uh, the sidewalk and public access, uh, the the ground floor design, in particular that goes into the kind of um, wall that you can have and the transparency, the window and how how big the windows uh, must have to be, um, public uh, plaza requirements, signage requirements, um, and then it goes into the findings, and those I think are particularly uh, important and interesting. Uh, and I'll just read those that that they will that this will promote a beneficial mix of required industrial and incentive uses, incentive office uh, retail. Um, that they will result in a superior site planning, uh, harmonious urban design relationships, and a safe and enjoyable um, streetscape. <clears throat> that uh, the third one would be that it will result in a building that has a better design relationship with surrounding streets and adjacent open areas. Fourth is that it will result in a development or an enlargement that will not have an adverse effect on the surrounding neighborhoods. And uh, that the uh, plaza requirements that will result will actually will result in a public plaza of equivalent or greater value as the public amenity, as a public amenity. Now, Remember that when uh, 12 Franklin comes back to us, the requirement that they have to show us is that what they are what they are proposing to, to continue to do is essentially the same project that we've already um, approved. And let's remember that 12 Franklin has been approved based on all of these conditions and requirements. And what we will be looking at with 12 Franklin is, is it essentially the same? Is there any significant change? And that will be coming before us in our May committee. So um, you, you, I wanted to make sure that Lucia sent this to us uh, well before May so that by the time we get to look at 12 Franklin, we'll have a sense, an overall sense of what it was that was required that we, that we um, that we approved, and and that is part of this too. It discusses what, you know, how 12 Franklin uh, was did, was in conformity with all of these conditions and requirements and the findings. So <clears throat> you'll have, so so I do recommend that you uh, look at this, uh, that you check it out and just familiarize yourself. Um, uh, not, I mean, definitely for the 12 Franklin, and then you'll have the basics for any future applications that we make. Um, I'll also mention that it looks like we have a pretty uh, full agenda on on May 1st. We have 
two presentations. Uh, the one that was supposed to be for tonight that had to be put over. I did tell them that they were going to have to wait, that we were going to put the, uh, the applications that needed to be voted on, that we were going to put them first. And um, I recommend that they consider whether, you know, they, they really wanted to be on our May 1st agenda for the presentations because they would have to stick around. And they assured me that they would be drinking plenty of coffee and they were willing to, to wait. So uh, we have several other applications that I think are coming. I don't know how many, but um, I do recommend that for May 1st that we try to have a, that we try to, you know, um, make our um, our concerns and our representations as uh, as as uh, non repetitious as possible. <clears throat> On the other hand, um, it's my sense that uh, we we do want to end our committee meetings by nine o'clock, nine thirty. But you know, there are times when we're going to have to be uh, ready to to go over because it just happens. It just so happens that these are things that are on the clock. And I, I know I don't have to explain that to you all. I just sort of wanted to make that statement, um, maybe more for uh, the, the fact that um, people um, will have to, or will hopefully understand if the committee goes over, it's because we are, we care and we are, you know, doing our best to, uh, uh, make things go as quickly as possible, but also to make sure that we're not just pushing something through just because it's time it's time for a cup of bedtime tea or whatever. So um, then one more thing I did want to mention to all of you is that it came up about abstention, which is an abstention. You know, what's the effect of an abstention? And um, the way I've always seen it, and we double checked with our legal people, uh, an abstention, and, and I think it's important for people to understand this, because I think often people just abstain because they say, well, I don't know, I just don't want to, you know, I, I, I don't know, I, I just can't make up my mind. But you do need to know that if an abstention stops the, uh, the uh, yes vote from getting a majority, an abstention can actually wind up being a no vote. It can it can stand in the way of of the passing of a motion. Um, I'm not saying people shouldn't abstain. I just think people need to have a you know a, an understanding of the fact that an abstention does have or can have um, a very significant effect on whether a motion passes. So um, that's that's about it. Um, now, can I ask a question about the ABIA? Oh, sorry, Steve, do you? IBIA, sure. Yeah. Do, do we uh, we we voted on them and we approved or we, with our conditions a number of them, and then they didn't get built, and the conditions have changed in some ways in the wake of the pandemic. And are we locked in with the conditions that we gave before, or can we rethink some of this? And would it be helpful to have Karen um, and Evergreen? guide us with what, what actually makes sense. And is there any way we could add geothermal? Is there any way we can what? Add a condition for geothermal. These buildings aren't built. And could we look at that corridor as potentially an area where there can be innovative non-fossil fuel um, energy? Or at least we could ask for it. My feeling is always that we can ask for what we want. Um, the the and 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 I think that this is a very important and interesting uh, you know issue that you bring up because we have been burned by some of these these um, projects and these special permits. The as I understand it, the regulation is the rule is that they have a right to. Um, that, 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 that the uh, applicant has a right to get a three-year extension, two, two three-year extensions actually, if uh, on the ground that the, um, the application is uh, essentially the same. There are no essential changes. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that we can't look 
as something like geothermal and say, you know, we would, and we can talk to them and ask if they would be, uh, if, it, if it's applicable here and what they would think about it. Also, if the area changed and there's something that we see that in good faith really makes this project different, significantly different, I suppose we can always, we can always uh, put that in and we can always bring that up and we can always if it's something that we feel that strongly about we can we can address it but but the um, as I understand it they are they can ask for the for the extension uh, provided that they have not materially changed the uh, the uh, project that we approved and that has been approved I don't know if, I mean, and to have Karen Nieves and Evergreen um, communicate with us on this and any insight they have, that's, that's great, that's fine. Um, so I, I would certainly, you know, say sure. I don't know if they want to come. I, I mean, I, Karen is, I don't know if Karen is uh, asked to be reappointed to the board, but Karen is always welcome at this. Well, I know that Evergreen were big supporters of these projects, and that was one yeah. of the things that really tipped the balance for the committee and for the board. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, are you maybe you're meaning that maybe we should ask uh, Evergreen and Karen to come to a meeting and discuss with us whether they actually are still in such great support in general. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, that makes sense. I wouldn't suggest it for May. I would say June. Um, but are the re reappointments coming up in May? Do we need to hear from them? Maybe we could hear independently from them, or we could ask them. Sure, if they want to give. Sure, we could. We could ask if they have any um, any new insight on uh, their support of these IBIA um, special permits. Jo uh, Joanna, is, is it possible for you to uh, to send them a note asking if they could uh, update on uh, us on that? Joanna? Hello? Yes. I'm sorry? Is it possible for you to send um, a note to Karen Nieves and Evergreen and ask them if they could update us on their generalized, overall generalized support of the IBIA special permit? Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a very good um, suggestion. Thank you, Trina. Um, you know, we're all going to miss you, right? All right well, I'm going to miss you guys. Then I have a question because I, my line, I was cut off. So I know you start talking about abstention and then when I reconnected, I don't know. Uh, 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 what if, did we got an answer about the abstention? Because I know there was some, um, Things uh, it goes into the yes, goes into the no. Yes, uh, yes, yes. Uh, uh, yes. It as some of us understood it, that that particular motion did not pass. Now, the, to for a motion to pass, the motion you have to have a majority of people who are present and able to vote, um, voting yes. Uh, so, if in in that respect, if you have enough abstentions to make it so that you don't have a majority of those present and and who can vote, you don't have a majority yes votes because you have some abstentions because those abstentions ca count in in terms of who's there, how many are there, and how many you how you're going to get your majority. Then those abstentions actually function as a um, a negative, basically, they function to defeat passage of that motion. And so, in regard to that, uh, I mean, we had three motions, right? So none of that three motion uh, at the last board meeting passed, right? I I don't remember now. I really I, I know there was that one motion that we were that we I was I'm only aware of uh, of our yeah, the final motion passed. about one motion. I was only the I'm because I thought Joanna, the final motion passed. Yeah. 
Oh, we, I told point, Joanna I said the that final, the final motion did pass. Yeah, I, I was talking oh. about the committee, the motion at the oh, committee. Oh, at the committee. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I wasn't talking about the full, full board. I was just oh, talking about the motion at the committee. Anyway, so I think it's okay, just, thank again, you. I, I just think it's um, that it doesn't, I'm not in any way implying that people should or should not abstain on motions, I just think that um, it should be, it should be clear what the um, what the consequences are of abstaining or what the consequence can be, and that's all. Also, um, there is to say sometime another formula is the no vote. I mean, I know it can be, uh, but you know that's why we are here. We vote yes, we vote no, and abstention definitely is one of the. Uh, fair formula, but being there, but just not responding and putting a no vote. So you you didn't say anything. I don't think it's fair either. You know, we had different idea. We put it there and, you know, and we fight sometimes for things, but I don't think uh, not giving a vote at all is courageous enough either. You know what I mean? Well, I, I differ with that. And sometimes we get information you know, I got last time information at five o'clock. It was too late for me to read the material, so I cannot come up with a uh, educated uh, opinion. So it all depends, like uh, the Fuller said, when these committee reports are done, for us to get it early enough so we can digest it. You know, that's my but, that's a, but don't you think, William, that that would be a very good case to abstain? You know yep. what I mean? What if somebody has to recuse themselves for, for a conflict of interest? Yeah, oh, that's, 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 yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, uh, recusal, as I understand it, and I can look further into this, recusal is different. I don't believe a recusal um, counts against it. That, that's how I learned it. But um, yeah, that's, that's an important question. A recusal is different. It's a different animal, so to speak. I, I see Corey and uh, Steve have their yeah, hands Corey, up. Corey, you had some, something to say? Yeah, I just wanted to follow up on the discussion we had at the last meeting around the land use conditions. Um, yes. I, had, uh, I followed up with uh, uh, Lincoln's office and um, we have gotten 13.21% uh, um, of the affordable housing um, that we were promised. That was one of the questions that the committee had wanted to know. And we were supposed to get 20% and we got, I guess, 13.21 out of 2100 units. Yeah, that's um, not good. So just that's, uh, if I understand, we were promised 33, 33% in the um, 2005 rezoning. I don't know. I had looked at a New York Times article just before this meeting that said that it was a 20, but well, I was looking at the case, points of agreement from the uh, from the 2005 okay. rezoning. Okay. Well, in any event, the number that we have is, is 13.21, um, so that we're all aware of that. Um, Arvind, who I spoke with, wasn't sure in terms of MIH, because that was the other question we were trying to ask. He thought, um, but he basically said we would need to have, uh, I guess you can get a, a fellow for the community board who could go through the data um, and we can make a request for that if we want to. But essentially there, he thinks we probably are in the most need of the lowest bar, sort of like six, you know, below 60% actually AMI. Um, and then at a higher kind of around 100, but he wasn't really sure. Um, but just to kind of note that it, it would take some time, but we could potentially get someone to do that for us. Um, and then I also asked him, you know, because we were talking about like sort of how much affordable housing we should ask for. Because I think really when you talk about 13.21% and then, you know, look at other community boards, which I did, by the way, contact CB6 and CB8. Um, and I could go sort of longer form into what their concerns were, but a lot of what they were more interested in was um, manufacturing, um, which obviously we're interested in too. But I think that our main focus is affordable housing because, you know, 13.21% and um, what is it? Uh, 2100 new units is really lopsided. So I think that explains, you know, our focus. Um, but just to say there, I brought up the idea of 35% and then 50%. And basically what he said was that, you know, 50% is definitely the goal. You know, it's like an, but more of a kind of an aspirational number and 35% is more, I think, 
what we may be able to get, but that it could be a good strategy to set our goal at 50%. And then when a developer, and this would be on a manufacturing to residential rezoning or a city owned property. So not, you know, say like a place on McCarran that just wants to go up two stories. So it, it depends on the leverage that we have. Um, but essentially he said that if we started at 50% and then they're unable to do it, we would then have the ability to discuss all of the other concerns that we have, which would be transportation, parks, environment, and we could then outline what is important to our district and say, okay, you know, we would consider something less than that, but on the, um, on considering if you would do these other things for us. So it basically is starting the bar high. So that way we have room to negotiate our other principles. Um, so, you know, I don't want to take too much of the committee's time on this, but I wasn't sure sort of where this conversation, you know, what was sort of the next step there and wanted to just follow up on the questions that uh, the committee had. You know, it seems to me that we've really been doing uh, something very similar to this. Um, we didn't ask 50%, but what we have been doing um, is we have been asking for more than what was required. And then we've been saying to the developers, okay, well, we've been doing just that. Okay, well then give us money toward the park, uh, give us something towards the transportation or whatever it is. And um, so it just seems to me that this falls in line with the direction we've been going in. I see Lucia, Mark, I see Lucia Marquez Reagan is here, hello. Welcome, Lucia. Thank you. You've been very helpful. Okay. Um, add something here. Um, yes, just let me ask if this, Lucia, did you want to say anything to, to the committee? I didn't realize you were here. No, I was just uh, listening and um, I thought that I wasn't sure what the agenda uh, for 12 Franklin was going to be. So I just wanted to um, listen in. But I, I also want to. Um, Say that we do have a housing, um, we have housing, our housing department, our uh, division at DCP that we could also um, run numbers in terms of affordable housing, um, housing units as well. Um, but you know, whatever is useful for the committee to to uh, have at their hands for these uh, presentations, I'm more than happy to to help out. That would be that would be great. If you do, you have any. One who can, oh, can we, could you uh, have someone come to us or, or give us information about what your sense is of what is, what, what uh, AMIs we really need the most and, and what we've achieved so far for affordability? Um, I can check in with our housing division and um, see what kind of information and in what format is going to be the, the best way to. Um, present it, and uh, I think a, a date kind of that we'd like to see it uh, would be helpful for um, for us as well. Well, um, as I said, May our May committee is pretty packed. I would, in good conscience, I could not ask you to come to that or to send anyone to it. But um, then June would be if you could have have something for us in, in our, our June committee meeting. Um, I'll inquire and uh, June, it's the first week, correct? Right? June for Joanna, do you know offhand the June meeting? Um, it's usually the first Monday of the month, but I just, I don't want to say that and then find out that there are some holidays. Let me check. I don't have the calendar with me right now, but I could get back to you. We can, sounds we'll, good. We can, we can uh, get it to you. Yes, thank you. Anyway, you uh, want to fine you. tune the questions too that we're asking. Sure. So we're asking what uh, what is the what uh, what the AMI um, numbers are that we most need. Uh, Arvin said he thought very low, like below sixty, and then higher around one hundred percent. How much affordability should we ask for? Uh, we've started to ask for 35s 
uh, and is there, toying is, with is, is Lucia, Lucia with city planning? Are you with city planning? Is she with city planning am, or with the city uh, council yes. or yes. who? who? Uh, so, okay. Yeah, sorry for not introducing myself. Yeah, yes. okay. department city planning. Sorry, I thought everyone knew Lucia. Um, I think yeah. we wanted to know what AMIs we currently have so we could know where the voids were. Okay, yes. that's, that's a good point. Yes, and what K AMIs we have. Which would lead to perhaps a city planning's concept of what are the what what are the AMIs that we most need that we would benefit most from. I think we need to determine that. Well, I think it would be we we can determine that, but it, wouldn't it be nice to know what city planning what their thoughts are? Um, we um, we asked we Arvin was you know able to share his. Uh, his thoughts on on what we need. That doesn't mean we agree, but yeah, I, I also think it I might be like, good. Go ahead. Yeah. I feel like their their plan is to build as many market rate units <laughs> as possible, um, as high as they can go, and um, you know I feel like yeah I think we need to impose upon them what our our district needs and our community needs. Well, I agree, but I don't think yeah. it ever hurts to ask people, ask the agencies what they think, what they see, what they are using as their criteria. Um, but absolutely, I agree with you. It's ultimately a, yeah. a, up to us, uh, including possibly asking for uh, fellows to come and help us get the information. Yeah. Yeah, I'd just like to. Um... In respond to what Corey put out there, and I'm really glad Corey you brought you brought this up. Um, yeah, I just I wonder if it'd be helpful if the committee members could see the points of agreement from the 2005 rezoning. Um, it addresses many different areas, including affordable housing and open space and height and bulk of buildings. Um, you'll see that it they committed to 33 percent of affordable housing units built, you know, it, it just in the, in the rezoned area, but I think we, you know, could apply it to the entire district. Um, and, you know, if we're at, we're at 13%, that's, that's really pathetic. It and, is pathetic. And I think, you know, if, if there are city owned properties, we should ask for a lot more than 50%. We should ask for a hundred, um, you know, cause like it, at Hunters Point South, you know, those buildings are in city owned property and they're between 60 and 70% uh, affordable housing and it's over there. So I think we, I, th I, 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 I suggest we'd be a lot more aggressive, you know, in that, in that regard. Um, and I feel like, you know, I think, you know, Rivering was a good, you know, good, you know, case in terms of we asked, we asked for 50% affordable housing and um, supposedly they're trying to, you know, they added 10% more than the 25 offsite, but I heard that that's all in limbo right now, but, um, it was on the table at one point, but, um, to make up, you know, to make up that gap, we need the city, you know, the mayor and the city council to, um, well, not really city council, but, you know, they really need to deliver, you know, and just offering building, you know, rezonings that are between 75 and hundred percent, uh, market rate is just. It's offensive, you know, that they keep offering those. Um, so that's my, I think the 20% number is the incentivized number. Like if in the, in the rezoned area, if, if developer adds, I think 20% of their uh, units or floor area uh, uh, allocated to units, then they get a density bonus. I think of like a third higher or something like that, but they're not required to do that. So, um, MIH re is required. So, so that's um, my two cents. Um, I just, uh, yeah, you know, and just quickly back to 12 Franklin, as you mentioned, they get, they can get two more renewals. And if they don't, if there's no substantial construction, then it, exp it expires. That's what I understand. Yes. Yeah. Yes, that's right. 
one thing, if I can just quickly dovetail on what Steve said and, and I, where I think it's important in the conditions about, you know, 50% or whatever we decide is that, you know, with river ring, when the developer is looking at the lot, they pay a certain amount of money for it based on the expectation of what they're able to build. So, the idea of trying to get ahead of it with a higher you know, amount is that then, you know, instead of them spending, I used to know this off the top of my head, but it was like 175 million, then it probably would have traded for say 140 million and then we could have gotten more affordable housing out of it. So, I think that sort of getting in front of that with our expectations on, you know, city owned sites or the sites that we really have more leverage is really important to, before the developer even buys it. Sure, this way they, they, the speculation price is lower. Yeah. Yeah. What's an example of a city owned site? Um, I think that Quay actually is, not that I want a building there, but. <laughs> That's a good, the MTA site. Yeah. I mean, and that, that I think we probably want to handle differently, which I don't want to, you know, divert from the main point here, but, you know, ultimately that, that is, yeah, an example. It's not a city owned site. It's an MTA owned site. So that, is that state then? Because MTA is state? Well, it's an, it's an agent, state agency owned, you know, whatever, you know, whatever, whatever that means. Um, but yeah, it's a municipally owned, you know, owned by a municipality or a government agency. It's, um, it's state, the, the governor says what happens there. Got yeah. it. But would we still, would be, what's a, yeah. yeah, just to find out what city owned sites are available in our district. You know, mm. That would be interesting, you know, also. Yeah. Uh, may, may I speak now? Um, sure. Thank you. Yeah. I'm just some household thing, you know, with us losing Trina, which all of us are heartbroken right now. But I'm concerned about us being able to make quorum because there are some committee members. I don't, and you, they'll tell you, you'll have to, you'll know who they are, but I don't mention names, but there's some committee members I don't recall seeing in many, many, many months. And that's having them add as the committee and they don't show up. That makes it hard for us to hit the quorum. So I, you know, I don't want to have someone removed, but if they don't show up, it puts us at jeopardy in not having quorum with the numbers, you know, the, and, you know, that's my concern. Uh, yes, I I I, uh, I reached out to someone today. I, I don't want to mention any names, but um, yes, we we have to. Um, uh, I'll be sending out some letters or a few letters to people who have not uh, attended consistently in in a very long time. Thank you. You're welcome. Corey, you go have your baby. <laughs> you don't have to. Yes. <laughs> Corey, you have your baby, and so you you you're, you're doing yeoman service. I, I think I can speak for the committee. Um, well, thank you guys. I, uh, you know, I, I will still try and attend. Um, yeah. You know, I dropped other committees actually, so I could make sure to be able to attend two meetings a month. But you know, anyway, the thank baby, you. the baby comes first. Thank you. Yes, I, I will. I will bring him to the meeting. meeting. I'll just to, you know, show him on screen for a moment there. Hey, you could bring him to the meeting. <laughs> hey, you know, why not? Anyway, thank um, you. Uh, I also request uh, something general um, for the future uh, because I never receive. I mean, uh, likely Joanna sent it to me at 6 p.m. Uh, it's very important, not just for me, but for all the committee members especially the one I'm more distracted about certain topics. There is landmark, land use, the library. And I saw the way I received the PDF with the presentation, you know, 15, 20 days before. Can we make sure that we have all the documents? If we don't receive it because they, they don't send it to us, uh, well, of course, we, the only chance we have is waiting for the presentation at the moment. But sometimes with all the detail, I mean, if we want to do a proper job, Personally, I need to analyze the drawings in time because I, I'm able to do uh, the proper comments. Can we make sure that the presentation uh, uh, send forward to all the committee member, hopefully, you know? Joanna, I, I, I'm under the impression that- you Yes, know. whatever comes in is sent out. Uh, yeah. Today, there was an update with the library 
I was yeah. not in today. I was off today. I send it as soon as I saw it when I checked the email. Uh, as soon as it, I saw it, it was it was sent out to everybody. But as soon as something comes into the community board that is land use, I do send it to the committee. Uh, but the, I saw Joanna, you sent something. Wasn't it originally sent on uh, March twenty uh, about was the landmark. Uh, uh, also, the library was he sent it days before. That, is he sent it to the chair? That's what, what I didn't understand. Or he sent it to the office? No. Uh, when said... uh, item comes in and there's a request to be on our a public hearing, um, that is sent first to the executive board to be considered to be put on the list. And there was a uh, back and forth about them being put on the on the list because they had came to us a few times and they were put on our community board meeting and then they cancel. This okay, is what, whatever is the process, it wasn't a criticism. Uh, I, I know every time I ask Trina, then Trina send it to me uh, and, and I ask to you today, you send it. But I'm, as a general thing, a certain point, once the executive board into, insert that into the agenda and we know they are coming, and is a week ahead, is five days ahead. Can can we make sure? I'm asking the chair of the land use to Dell. Can we make sure that once it's finalized, that they're going to come to us if we have the presentation the moment they arrive? All the committee member uh, have it, this presentation. Sure, I, I I thought that was if I would imagine. Well, that definitely is something that I would prefer. Is that is that uh, any kind of a problem, Joanna? No, it's not. We just no. today we received two last minute. Uh, I know, I know from the library and also right. from uh, North right. 11. Sure. So for the future, library. yes, yes, Dante. Yeah, and, and the more we can push them to have it in time, you know, uh, it may yeah. be uh, uh, useful, you know, yeah. and do last minute and that's all. Yeah. But thank you again. Sure, absolutely. And and Steve, I think you wanted to mention something about these um, the batteries and the yeah, installation. Yes, thanks. Uh, yeah, 315 Berry Street, the uh, battery storage system, they, you know, applied for a special permit um, to install that on a residential building where rezoning doesn't allow it. It's still, it's still go ongoing. Uh, I attended a hearing uh, that addressed that matter back last Tuesday. And um, I read testimony that was based on the responses from the land use committee and the two multiple responses from the environmental committee. And um, so there's been a, the, the Adams administration appointed a new chair of the board of standards and appeals, basically promoted the vice chair to chair and the previous chair is no longer on the board. And, and the previous chair is much more favor. She was much more in tune to the safety issues, uh, the safety concerns. Um, the, the current chair, Shampa Chandra, they're more thinking about zoning. You know, how, how does this meet the qualifications? So to, to basically qualify for the special permit, only serving the local vicinity, you know, you know, basically receiving a benefit from this installation, taking, you know, um, supporting the power grid. Um, as far as safety and building integrity issues, because that was an issue, whether this old building with crumbling facade, which still has not been uh, remedied, the, the, the owner has uh, 16 violations with DOB and Environmental Control Board, um, totaling almost $150,000. And um, but the board basically said, we're deferring these issues to other agencies, you know, the building integrity and repairs to DOB. Uh, FDNY will sign up on the safety and you know fire issues and DEP about noise. Um, you know they and basically saying that the permit is conditional on those agencies signing off with those those concerns. Um, and then another interesting element to this thing is the tenants uh, hired an attorney, and they were present at the meeting, and they they requested an adjournment. The board basically rejected the adjournment. But they're allowing the attorney to respond to the BSA's base, you know, assertion that um, this is going to qualify for the special permit. They have three weeks to respond, and then the applicant's attorneys, um, 
Sheldon LaBelle can, has three weeks to respond to them. So it's going to go on for at least like another six weeks, maybe longer before the, you know, the board makes um, a decision. Um, the, the lawyer basically was asserting that since this is a essentially a rent um, controlled building, it's a loft building that uh, preventing access to the roof or full access to the roof is a violation of that. And they also picked up on the fire safety issues. Remember that the FDNY came to the board and said that uh, they don't have experience extinguishing fires of this type at this scale. And so, I, you know, that's what I read in the testimony and he picked up on that. So uh, I'm not sure, you know, what they're going to do with that, but so that's kind of where things are at. Um, and just um, preview coming attractions with the mayor's city of yes proposal and, you know, the it's in, you know, it's three sections. One of them is city of neutrality, carbon neutrality, and there's 17 um, text amendments part of that. And one of them is related to these battery storage systems. There's not, there isn't actually language that um, sp specifies, you know, this specific type of mechanism. It just says electric, electric uh, substations. And so they want the language to specifically say that, but it'll still under a certain amount of square footage on the roof, it will still require a special permit to the BSA. So that's, um, that's the story with that. So, um, um, but it's look, you know, unless this attorney can really turn things around through the legal means, it's looking like it's being set up to be approved. So, um, yeah, just one more thing is this, just we found out is in a, in a commercial district where there's residential being built over the commercial space, uh, these BSSs are, are allowed as of right. So, um, it was interesting to know. So, anyway, that's, that's that. What's allowed as of right, Steve? To build these battery storage systems oh, wow. on, on a roof. Yeah. Wow. Well, that's depressing. Scary, actually. Well, thank you. Thank you for the update anyway. All right. Um, if anyone does, if, if, um, unless someone has something they want to add, it's uh, getting late. And I uh, hope everyone who's celebrating a holiday this week and next week, I hope you all have good holidays. And if you're not celebrating a holiday, I still hope you have a really great week <laughs> and nice weather. Happiness. Thank you, Dell. The same, same to you. Yes, uh, happy holidays, and and uh, still, just a quick still. shout out to William Vega, the New Yorker of the week. Oh, yeah. Yes. I, I, Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations, William. Congratulations. You know, see, and and we think that it's all a thankless job, but you know, there you go. It is a thankless job. It's a great job. piece. And congratulations, anyway. New York <laughs> yeah. one. Check it out. Oh. Well, we all thank you, Trina. We thank you, Dell. Everyone. I thank everybody here. <laughs> We all make a difference in our little way, you know, yeah, so God bless you all. Okay. Good night, everybody. Happy good night. Good night. Take Bye. care, everybody.